crew, so I go by she, her, hers. And today I will be the panel's moderator. Um, I won't say more about me because today is really about the environmental justice advocates that are here with us today. And I want us to spend most of our time hearing what they have to say. So um, the way our structure will be for, for the time that we have together, about 60 minutes or so, um, I will go ahead and do very brief introductions of folks, and then you'll hear personally from our panelists as they introduce themselves and their work. Um, we will have plenty of time for Q&A discussion. Um, we do have, however, before we get to Q&A, some prompted questions just to spur some discussion among our panelists. Um, so with that said, um, you are in the environmental justice panel. Um, we are recording, so um, don't feel pressed to write down all of the amazing things you will hear. We will share a recording of this session um, post-summit. So just a quick overview intro as you have read in your program. The state and the nation continue to struggle to advance racial equity as environmental justice communities who tend to be black, indigenous, people of color, and low-income communities suffer from decades of disinvestments impacting every facet of life, including health, housing, heat, and pollution exposure experience. And these inequities are even more heightened during the pandemic, right? They've been exacerbated during the pandemic. So today, we will have a discussion around um, this very topic of environmental justice and environmental injustice. So, I will start by um, introducing our rock star panelists um, joining us today. Um, we have Cassius Spears Jr. He is a district conservationist um, with USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, and a member of the Narragansett Indian Tribe. And Cassius, I think I got this right. Um, you are related to Loren. You are Loren's cousin. Nephew. Nephew. Oh, gosh. I was close. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Cassius. Um, Cassius pursued a career in conservation work to promote sustainable so social ecological relationships that protect and conserve Mother Earth. He was taught as a young at a young age to acknowledge the water, soils, and non-human kin with humility, compassion, and respect. And Cassius attended the University of Rhode Island. Um, and received an environmental science and management degree. Thank you for being part of the panel, Cassius. Um, and David Release. David Release has been a social and environmental activist for almost 25 years and has worked on several local and national campaigns that address climate justice and social inequalities in marginalized communities. Currently, David is the environmental justice chair and vice chair of the Rhode Island Sierra Club, which supports environmental justice initiatives in Rhode Island. He is also the director of Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition to Reduce Poverty, which fights poverty and inequality in the state. Thank you so much, David, for being part of the panel. And Sharad, Sharad Wertheimer, did I pronounce your, please correct me, Sharad. Wertheimer. I was not even close. <laughs> Thank you, Sharad, for being kind about that. Often called Jose by Spanish speakers, um, joined the Woodnuskatucket River Watershed Council as a river ranger in the summer of 2021, and in March of 2022, became the Nuevas Vo Voces New Voices Program Coordinator. He graduated from Brown University in 2019 with a degree in American Studies. Sharad followed his lifelong love for the natural world to his current position at the Winnesotake River Watershed Council. As a coordinator of Nuevas Voces, Sharad works with a cohort of Latinx residents in Oneville to develop their capacity to be leaders for environmental and social justice in their neighborhood. And I should also point out, um, because they are rock stars, um, this, is a, this is a summary, right, of their bio. If you want to learn more about um, all of our speakers today and this um, panel, um, in this green sheet of paper, there's a QR code for you. You can actually pull up all of the speaker bios online. Just a way for us to conserve some paper and also digitalize them. All right, so with that said, I am going to go ahead and kick it over to our panelists. Um, Gerard, want to go ahead and get started and just for about five minutes, just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work and what brings you here today. 
Sure. And if you want to come out, feel free. Or if you want to stay, whatever you would like. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? I'll just speak loud. Okay. Um, yeah, hey everyone. Um, really uh, very humbled to be here um, among so many people working on, um, you know, some of the most important stuff that we can be doing, which is help to, you know, uh, protect our environment and uh, protect our, our communities. Um, and especially, uh, you know, very humbled to be here with uh, uh, my fellow uh, folks who have spent their lives working towards environmental justice. Um, so yeah, um, my position is um, directing a relatively new program at the Winnesquehannock River Watershed Council, um, which is geared around training a cohort of around twenty. Uh, Latino residents in the neighborhood of Olneyville in Providence. Um, do you guys know roughly where Olneyville is? Oh, maybe not. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I forget that, you know, not everyone lives in Providence sometimes, you know? Uh -huh. So it's on the west side of Providence, and it's a mostly um, low-income immigrant neighborhood. Um, most of the people, I think the vast majority, are uh, yeah, from Latin America, the Guatemalans and Dominicans are kind of the main uh, immigrant groups in the neighborhood, as well as many other groups uh, from other places in Central America. We have people in our cohort from Bolivia, Nicaragua, Mexico, um, Chile. We have a, a really wide diversity of different folks. So this program is an entirely um, Spanish language um, training program where people um, in the neighborhood are paid to come to sessions where they're learning about um, climate change and environmental issues that affect their community. Um, and then another big goal is that we're giving them the tools and the resources to be able to become kind of ambassadors for their community around these kind of issues. Um, so, you know, some of the main environmental issues that uh, are faced in Olneyville are um, a big risk of flooding it is, it is, a, is a huge one because the Winnesquehannock River uh, has um, its floodplain uh, along this street called Valley Street. Um, and in 2010, um, we had really huge flooding in that area due to um, a big storm that dumped a, a lot of rain over a 48 hour period. And there were hundreds of homes that were flooded um, during that time. And because uh, people, you know, because of the language barrier and the lack of information accessible to people, many folks, you know, were in a very uh, vulnerable position um, where they didn't know what to do. They, you know, didn't, they were, you know, had severe damage to their homes and maybe they didn't even know how to evacuate, for example. Um, and then didn't um, have access afterwards to information about the, you know, the risk of like mold and water damage in their homes. Um, and so, you know, that, that will happen in any community that, that is flooded, but then that gets compounded because of, you know, the social factors in that neighborhood. I mean, you know, people speak Spanish. People don't have, you know, um, a big savings account to be able to just go to another state or, you know, go to a, visit a family in another state for, you know, an extended amount of time to be able to um, weather out that storm. So just one example um, of how, you know, uh, these kind of issues, um, environmental issues, really compound with the social, economic, um, you know, realities in neighborhood, low-income neighborhoods, um, neighborhoods with, with folks of color, um, to create these like really special challenges. Um, so, um, you know, other issues that you know affect Olneyville are um, poor air quality, and this is uh, in large part due to the highways that run right through the neighborhood. Route six and Route ten kind of converge right there in Olneyville, uh, meaning that the levels of um, airborne uh, particles. Um, and contamination are a lot higher, and you can see that correlated with increased rates of asthma. Um, 
in, in Olneyville. Um, other big things include urban heat island. Um, you know, it's just, there are not as many trees in the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, that leads, especially with people living in, you know, three-story high rise and stuff like that who might not be able to run AC all the time, that leads to, you know, a high risk of heat. So, um, giving the, you know, our participants in the language that they speak all that information and then connecting them um, and with people who can actually, you know, who have decision-making power um, so that they can, you know, advocate for themselves um, and also educate their own community members about it to, you know, try to make changes that will benefit their families and their health. Thank you. I think, I think that was like five minutes, was that? Perfect. We'll have plenty of more time. Thank you for that, Gerard. Tasha, so for you. When you suck. Um, and the Kasabis, Tasha Spears, Batne, Kantoe, Aki, Batne, Kisa, Muni. My name is Kasha Spears. I'm the, the citizen of the Narragansett Indian tribe. I also sit in a uh, different capacities within the tribe um, as a uh, uh, tribal leader and a, um, um, a, I guess, someone that passes on or continues uh, culture, tradition, I guess you call it culture bearer, um, but ma mainly um, um, someone that is just there for the community and helps in any way that the uh, that <coughs> desires me to uh, assist. Um, I'm also, professionally, I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I am the district conservationist for Providence County, uh, the Northern District. And, and also, in that role, I'm also the urban coordinator for the state of Rhode Island, um, which is in a position that's been new, newly created um, from um, the, some of the new language that was put into the last farm bill. Um, creating an office of urban agriculture. And uh, so I'm thankful to be here with you all today. I think, thank you to sit here with uh, my uh, colleagues up here and doing the work that they've done within um, the communities of Rhode Island. Uh, a little bit about my professional role uh, working with urban communities. Uh, for those of you that may not know Rhode Island, or may know Rhode Island, but Providence County is the most populous uh, di district, uh, county in the state, and it has a range uh, from very rural to uh, urban, and then everything in between. Uh, so it's very interesting in my line of work because if many of you may, may know NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the work that we do, but our, our motto is helping people help the land. Um, we provide technical assistance and financial assistance to uh, people that um, take care of the land, steward the land, and they have control over an area and they can apply for our programs. And there's a whole booth out there that you can go and get information, get the whole rundown on our programs. Um, I'll spare you that today, but if you're interested, come see me after. Um, but it's a great it's a great place because I get to go into communities of all different types, all different demographics, and, and, and see what what's happening on the ground, see what conservation needs are out there, and, and figure out, be creative, um, use that creativity that many of us uh, would wish we could use in our jobs. Um, but I have a government job that allows me to be creative, so I'm happy about that and go out there and solve problems. And that's our, what we do, solve problems. We look we look at the landscape and, and we figure out we have a whole bunch of practices that are intended, that have been tried across the country and are true and can solve many of our natural resources uh, problems. Now, this for me, it's a great, and I, a lot of times as an indigenous or native person, we work within in-between spaces. So it's really nice because I'm very much able to work within that in-between 
And what I mean by in between is that I get to take my knowledge, my understanding of, of this place and my position within creation, and I get to apply it to my job, my daily job. Um, and what I mean by that is I get to help people connect themselves back to the land. I get to create that, that, that feeling of stewardship, that feeling of caregiving, and, and doing it through science, which is something that uh, indigenous people uh, prescribe to in many ways because it's a method that we relate to because it's one that our knowledge is also similarly formed based on off of observation, based on trial and peer review. So it's, it's, it's nice for me to be in this position and help these communities and you know, it doesn't hurt to have financial assistance, so they like me to come out and I'm not EPA or anything, not that there's any EPA to do it, but I'm out there to slap someone on the wrist, usually they had to hand them a check. So I'm, I'm pretty good with that, because people are usually happy uh, with NRCS when we come on, uh, on their land. Uh, but anyway, that's a little bit about what we do, and, and uh, I thank you all for being here. Thank you, yeah. David, over to you. Uh, my name is David Belize. Uh, I'm honored to be spending time with all of you and kind of listening to Priscilla. Um, as Priscilla mentioned, I've been in environmental justice and social justice organizing for a very long time, um, almost 25 years. And I know what you're thinking, oh my god, you're so young. You look so young. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I started a long, long time ago when I was young. Uh, I grew up in the Bronx. I'm from New York. Um, and I think early on, I, like many people, started noticing that we, our neighborhood looked a lot different than other neighborhoods. We didn't have uh, trees, we didn't have green space. Um, at the time, New York City, like many urban cities, was um, disproportionately, I mean, communities of color had less green space disproportionately than other communities. And so I started as a community garden organizer. Luckily, just kind of the stars aligned, and I was able to get that kind of a job. Um, so I was kicked out of school, and I needed a job. And uh, it just, just something beautiful happened in me that I realized that I wanted to work with the earth. So I started building community gardens. I started, um, I got a garden design degree. I started uh, designing them. But what I really enjoyed, what I enjoyed working with my hands and building gardens, but what I really noticed was that there was a piece missing, which was organizing the community in the neighborhood to take care of a garden, right? Because uh, I don't know if any of you do community garden organizing, but there's two types of gardens. This is going to be really quickly, so. Uh, there's a garden that you, this organization, sometimes well-meaning, can come in and build, and then there's a garden that comes from the community. Nine, to, nine out of ten times that garden that the uh, top down came and built will go on whatever, you know what I'm saying, unmanaged. They won't take care of it. Uh, and we found that a lot in New York. There was, at the time, a lot of gardens were coming up and getting built that no one was taking care of. And then there was also a lot of empty lots that the community were building up. Um, and then when the community garden war started in New York under Giuliani, I don't know if you've heard that name. Um, who was our mayor at the time, uh, I started getting involved in more radical organizing, understanding the systemic oppression that I've always been uh, experiencing, but I didn't know how to articulate it or put it together in my brain. And so I started to understand that in order for us to really have change, we need to not only have um, resources but good policy. And so I started getting involved in more policy issues. I ran a lot of youth programs, um, teaching environmental justice uh, in New York, worked on a couple of national campaigns. I used to run Sierra Club's um, youth program in New York for many, many years, connecting youth to the outdoors. And uh, I moved to around about six years ago, and I swore I would never do be an organizer again, because it's awful. We don't get paid enough, and it's awful. Um, that's one. And so, but there's still, when I got here, I, you know, I had never been to Rhode Island before. Actually, no, that's not true. I used to go, I used to go to Narragansett uh, to visit family. 
uh, a straight track. And I had never been to Providence before, so I always thought that Providence was now again, like the same thing. <laughs> and so I was really bummed about coming, moving to Rhode Island, not because I didn't love Narragansett, but I just figured there were gonna be no people like me. And it turns out there's more Guatemalans in Providence than Guatemala than in New York. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> I go up on tangents. Um, when I moved here, um, I didn't want to be an organizer anymore. I wanted to just paint and write and open a bar. Um, but I started working for an organization uh, that worked on lead poisoning. And little by little, I got sucked back in with all the work that we still have to do. Um, so now I, I, I started um, working with the Sierra Club again as a volunteer. And um, I'm the environmental justice chair. We, for the last six years since I've been here, have really partnered with local environmental justice organizations on environmental justice issues, mostly on air quality, um, working with uh, campaigns like No, uh, no LNG and PPP, which many of you have heard of, um, supporting local social justice groups like PRISM and DARE. Um, and we really uh, have tried to change um, the idea of conservation um, versus environmental justice in the work that we all do prioritizing environmental justice and everything that we do. So, um, and now I'm here and I'm, I'm honored to be with all of you. I know we still have a lot of work to do and I'm happy to be a part of that. Thank you, David. Yeah, after long hours at the State House, David and I have talked about that one day he will open up his bar and I will open up a cafe. <laughs> we still have a lot of work to do between now and then. Um, thank you all. Uh, so before we dive into the rest of our panel discussion, I have a nice treat for you all. Um, the Providence Retro Environmental Justice Committee that goes by the RUJC, they had a conflicting event in Providence and couldn't be here. Um, but I coordinated with them and um, we've arranged for them to be here in spirit so you don't get exposed to their work. And what's really nice about this, I think it, this was back um, either 2019 or 2020, um, right before the start of the pandemic, where then um, sustainability director Liam Bamberger came with um, their climate justice associate um, and a member of the SJC um, to present what is now known as the Providence Climate Justice Plan. Um, so if you have not read the Providence Climate Justice Plan, I strongly suggest that you do. It is nationally recognized. It's a national landmark. Um, and I'm glad I see Julia here with the city of Providence. Um, and it also serves as a great model for our state of how to do it better, how to do it right, really centering the voices of those that are most impacted by climate change, who are on the front line and bearing the brunt of carbon pollution. So that process um, kicked off um, several years ago, and it really started community-led and building a partnership, which is now known as the Fraser Environmental Justice Committee, PRJC, and the City of Providence, a co-governance model for developing this nationally recognized climate justice plan. And what was really great about that is that you, you see in the plan what we're used to seeing in a climate action plan, uh, which is, you know, how are we going to reduce carbon emissions? How are we going to mitigate? How are we going to adapt to climate change? But what it did was center equity. Said so this is the prime ingredient, the, the critical ingredient for this climate justice plan, and everything else will be rolled around that. Um, and what was really cool for me um, a few years ago when that process kicked off and I was meeting um, community members who were working on this plan, um, we had questions to go into the community and ask, right, even before starting to develop this plan. And I, it was such a wonderful experience for me. I got to go through the questions with my sister and then with my mother, and I was translating them. And of course we had you know, English, Spanish script, um, and it was nice to hear the different perspectives, also the generational perspectives there. And we were asking very simple questions, like how do you cool and heat your home? What do you need you know, to, to cool and heat your home? Um, what are the things that we should be thinking about you know, when we're thinking about equity, sustainability? So just very simple questions. And we learned a lot, I learned a lot through that experience. And really kudos to the Racial Environmental Justice Committee. I mean, they were out in their community really talking to folks to ensure that their needs were centered in this Providence Climate Justice Plan. 
So really quickly before I play the, the nice street that I have for you all, um, I want to just tell you a little bit about the more about the Providence Racial Environmental Justice Committee. Um, their executive director is um, Ava Brown, and there are community members um, that are part of the RAJC. Um, they are dedicated to bringing racial equity and environmental justice to Providence frontline communities. They're holding the city accountable as to how it implements this um, climate justice plan. So their mission, um, and I will read it because I think it's really impactful. Their mission, we, the frontline communities of color of Providence, invite the city of Providence to join us in building new systems that are good for all people, not just the few. A racially equitable and just Providence must actively work against and transform current and historic social inequities based on race, class, gender, immigrant status, and other forms of oppression. A racially equitable and just Providence puts capital and resources where these inequities are the greatest. And that gives me chills when I read that. So, um, Vadik Kumba, um, he's actually the vice chair of the Providence Sustainability Commission that is chaired by Julian Drix, and also for a number of years was chaired by Sue Anderblom. Um, and I should also mention, I mentioned Leah Bamberger, Leah Bamberger as a director of sustainability. Now, Emily Koo is a director of sustainability. So these are amazing groups of people that are working within city government and in frontline communities and building this co-governance model. Um, so, uh, Vadi Kumba, uh, who is the vice chair of the Sustainability Commission, um, he's an artist as well. So he developed um, what is known as future stories. So these future stories are super impactful. I remember when I first heard them, again, getting chills. And it's this vision working with the community that really talks about what those needs are and envisioning what it will look like when the Providence Plan of Justice Plan is implemented. So I'm gonna check time. Hopefully we can get through two of them. They're very short, but I'm gonna start playing um, I think the first one um, that I would like to play for you, um, it comes from a renter's perspective. All right, and I'm just about volume as we need. You all know I see everything. I've been in and around here for almost 30 years now. It's good to see the neighborhood finally get the investment we deserve and all. But we know what comes with capital improvements. It's scary to see this place slowly get cleaned up. Cause who been cleaning it up, huh? Like I said, I've been here, lived all through Providence. I saw how they planted trees and put in gardens for the community on the West End. Then soon enough, people like me had their rent going way up and got evicted. Seems like landlords around here just wanna make room for students and professors. Anybody that can charge a little bit more to live. My landlord tried to raise the rent just for making basic repairs, like fixing a broken window. But we organized and fought for laws to protect our right to stay in our homes. Now, they can't raise the rent for making basic health and safety improvements they should have done a long time ago. If my landlord tried to harass me before, I always knew I could call Dale for help. Now, I can call the city too and get connected to a lawyer that'll help me fight against getting evicted. The city also passed this thing that made landlords show how much gas or electricity apartments use. You know all those hidden costs? Like, if the rent is $500, but the heat is $500 a month too, that's definitely not a deal. I can help my niece find a new place, and it's a lot easier to know what she can afford now. We ended up getting her a place near me. She signed what they call a green lease. So she pays the same as she used to for rent and energy bills, but the landlord had to make some energy efficiency upgrades. I saw it was working for her, so naturally we organized folks in my building. Now we got green leases too, and it's helping us save that other green. You know, on the bill, mm. <laughs> my gas feels lower because I don't need to put the heat up so high to stay warm. The windows and walls keep us warm in the winter, and the new insulation keeps us cool in the summer. This year, we're getting an electric heat pump that's gonna replace the AC and the natural gas boiler. Turns out, 
that natural gas is really just toxic gas burning in our house. Developers want to put a new building up next door, but these days, developers are responsible for reporting the impact of their project, letting us know how traffic was going to be affected, how much pollution they'll make, and how they're going to avoid pushing us out of our neighborhood. The city also requires the developers work with folks who live here to create a community benefit agreement. They asked me to join a few other neighbors to facilitate a community-wide conversation. We ended up with a good agreement. Over 500 people from the neighborhood signed off on the project before it passed at city council. It's actually one of the first zero energy buildings. The appliances are really efficient. The walls and windows have good insulation, even solar panels on the roof. Best part is, when they pick the tenants, they have to prioritize groups that have historically been displaced in Providence. I feel better about the progress in the neighborhood now. I feel like my voice isn't ignored or just humored, you know? I feel like my point of view is actually honored. We'll stop there. Not in and don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will stop there. This is in our the my time. son. Who's that? So these are amazing. Um, if you go to the city's website, the Office of Sustainability, the feature stories are there. They're all in English and Spanish. You'll hear from the youth perspective. You'll learn about green justice zones. Um, you'll hear from a bodega perspective, which I love hearing because it reminds me of. Um, growing up in the South Side, um, right off Broad Street. So really encourage you to listen to them. They're really beautiful and they're also impactful. So we're going to go back to our awesome panelists. Uh, Want to just first hear your thoughts, reactions to that clip? Uh, or yeah, anything that's on your mind? Um, well, it's just a good reminder that I think the foundation of uh, the work that we do is the understanding that environmental justice is social justice. Uh, that fighting climate change for us is about climate justice. Uh, there are some things that can't be removed from the idea of um, environment. What I mean is, like, for us to care about clean water and clean air, we also have to care about uh, just housing, food insecurity. Um, you know, there's this, there, there has been, like, um, this weird idea that some communities of color don't care about the environment or conservation issues uh, because you don't see them as much engaged in certain areas. But the truth is a lot of our communities come from those kind of communities where they, you know, are part of the land in that way. It's just that we're just trying to survive and really uh, pay rents, uh, utilities, you know, get our kids to school, find a job. And some of these things disproportionately uh, impact those communities because of racism and because of systemic oppression. So we can't remove those two things. And that's just a good reminder of that. Thank you, David. I agree. Other thoughts, reactions? Well, I, I, I think that, I like the comments, I'll add, I'll add to that say that um, environmental justice is about relationships as well as social justice and I think it's a process that needs to be understood in a restorative process and I guess you could tie in restorative justice as a part of this um, and I think that we have to understand we have to first understand the truths that a lot of this a lot of the issues that we see that are disproportionately affected by um, underserved or socially disadvantaged or BIPOC or um, these minority communities um, is from a history of violence, um, not just against people, but against the land itself. So I think that, you know, we understand in, in my culture, you know, um, many indigenous cultures, but um, it's, that the relationship with with the land, with the earth, is a relationship between, um, you know, um, similar to a, a child and a mother. You know, we look at the land as a female, we see the land as a female, as a mother, as a caregiver, as a nurturer. 
So when you have anything that is done over time, where where um, that activities have been done to destroy or sever those bonds, it is like severing a child from their mother, you know, uh, and that's violence. So I think you have to understand. And I think if you think about it in those terms, these communities have that history and they wear those scars on them, and it's a part of their life. And it's not necessarily. It's the systems that have made that have separated people from the land, uh, people, from these communities from the place. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that in you know to that my tribe has a fraction of the land that we um, historically once had. I think I did the math. I think it's less than one percent of our land historically um, that we still have today. Um, but that's still at least we have that uh, uh, that connection. And, well, so for folks in these communities to restore that, you look at it as environmental justice as a restorative process, in that, and one that we can envision a future, a future where these problems, these issues are, have been solved, um, that, the, that the entities that have created that are the ones that are also fixing those, those separations, that we can envision a future, and that's very much also in, I can't, Again, I'm going to keep tying this back. I can't, that's what I know. But it ties back to, again, the indigenous understandings of thinking seven generations ahead, thinking of that future, not just thinking of what is needed today, but what is what the unborn, our, our future um, relatives, um, you know, um, our grandchildren, our great great grandchildren, what kind of world will they be in? So I, I like to enjoy that video because it, 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 it I think if we can do more of those works of these offering different perspectives, perspectives and then going into a future of what these what a world would look like, I think that would be um, I think that's helpful because this is a restorative process and restorative requires people sitting down and having conversations, understanding this information, hearing different perspectives, understanding these communities and what they're dealing with, not just today. I mean, today, but just also in the past, bringing those histories to the front and then thinking about where we want to go as a future collectively. Because, um, you know, I, some people, as a Native person, they always like, well, you know, like, like, for example, land back is a term that we probably heard in social media um, and it's said by tribes, but land back doesn't mean to give all the land back to necessarily to the tribes or to the nations here. In some ways it does, but in other ways it's understanding that we understand in our culture that this, that we have a, um, that we need to move forward. And we need to have, create a place in which we all can live on Turtle Island, on this place, on this land, where we all have equal access, equal shares to these places, to these environmental um, services, to these environmental um, vistas and places of awe, places of ceremony, places of community, places that are green. You know, we all have and should have equal access to those things. I'm going way off now, but yeah, I mean, I'm tangent. But, but anyway, uh, I think so that it got to be sparked and your comments continued those, those, uh, that idea, so thank you. Thank you, you said some of my favorite words and phrases of building new relationships that it's really a collective, collaborative process. And I, and I think what I often um, think about in terms of work, you know, how can we be supportive, we meaning um, environmental organizations, um, be supportive to um, frontline communities um, and communities most impacted by climate change on the front line, you've got to show up, you've got to listen, you've got to roll up your sleeves, you've got to do the work to really build the relationship. So thank you for, for all of that, Cassius. Any thoughts, reactions to the clip we heard, or anything that you're thinking about? Um, it's a great when it's so open, right? It's kind of a little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Just gotta take a breath after all that to digest the. Um, yeah, that uh, the clip brought up a lot um, for me. Um, I think that one thing that came through very clear is that uh, 
especially in this clip, is is that economic um, that environmental justice especially cannot be you know uh, that economic justice cannot be forgotten in this conversation. Um, and because I guess a a, a big uh, thing that I think about a lot in, in the work that I do is that um, often you know. Uh, the environment that you live in in these days is, is a lot of times dependent on where you can afford to live. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with the immigrant folks that I, that I work for, um, they could not, in many cases, afford to continue living in the countries that, that they came from. And many times, you know, I, they've touched on this. I mean, the, many of the folks that I talk to come from places where they can, they, they drink the water that flows out of the mountain, you know, where their land where they, they've lived, their families have lived for generations, like there's fruit trees and avocados and limes and um, mangoes just growing, you know, where they can, uh, just like run around, run right down to the river and, and swim and, and fish in it. Um, and where they, they really have a very intimate relationship with the environment. And, but they could not afford to live there anymore. And that's because of, you know, many reasons, but you know, political violence, um, and, but also frankly, economic, economic violence too, even if it wasn't a gun pointed to their heads, you know, um, Many times, you know, there are folks in my uh, program whose families, you know, made their living just growing, you know, and selling in the local markets. And uh, they just couldn't afford to feed their families that way anymore. Um, and, you know, you can go into this whole thing about like NAFTA and uh, international trade, which we'll save for another uh, panel. Um, but, um, but in essence, you know, so like, the families that I talked to, you know, uh, you know, an uncle might have come to Providence in 1980 and made more money working under the table at a liquor store off of Manton Avenue than their family, whole family, did growing, you know, corn and tomatoes and you know everything like back home in Guatemala, in you know one of the most luscious places that that there is on earth. Bias, of course, because my family is also from Guatemala. But um, <laughs> so I, I guess you know, and so um, so I have family families who left you know that environment to live in a gray box, you know, um, and where their kids are growing up, you know, um, not knowing all those things that that there were there before, not not getting to know those plants, not getting to. Uh, uh, be in touch with the environment the same way that their um, that their parents were in. On top of that, being exposed to lead in the old house they live in, being exposed to the contamination in the air. Um, so um, I think, uh, and all this because this is actually just like the way they can actually afford to, you know, actually feed their families. You know, um, and I think that. Uh, so it's important for us to all, to all recognize that, you know, and that um, you know when when my uh, when the folks my when I ask the people in my group like what is important to them, you know, the environment is definitely important to them. But then they also you know say you know I can't afford rent, you know that's that's a huge thing. Um, or even stuff like uh, um, what came up in the last. The last session that we did was uh, people were really frustrated about the food in the cafeterias, how like it, it was just not nutritious, um, and so I guess um, when we, you know, talk about environmental justice, we can't we can't ignore those things, um, and it all you know boils down to, you know, it, it's the right of every person you know to be able to live in a healthy environment and have a relationship. With um, with nature and each other, and that uh, 
yeah, that's just always what we have to keep in mind when we do this work. And so we've been hearing from you all what, what is environmental justice, what is environmental injustice, and thinking about what some of the things you've mentioned um, about environmental justice or climate justice is social justice, is economic justice. It's all intersectional. It's restorative, restorative process and justice. Um, anything else that you would like the audience to know in terms of your perspective? What is environmental justice? or environmental injustice, or what it's not? Um. Well, um, one of the things that I think about a lot is uh, the value that we put on human life in certain communities versus other communities. Um, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. Many of you have also. I always look at you, Sheila. Um, <laughs> And we've been to plenty of conferences, and we've been to plenty of workshops, and we've seen so many commercials, and um, you can tell I'm a little jaded. Uh, and I think that clip reminded me of that distrust that, you know, like, gentrification is such a big problem, right? And even though it's like beautifying the community, like all of a sudden you can hear their voice, oh, but that's going to break this. And so there's this distrust that it's never going to change. Um, because one of the things that I think a lot of the communities that are impacted feel like their value isn't, um, their lives are not valued the same way. So when they're trying to, when the city or the state are planning to build, you know, new infrastructure, um, you know, fossil fuel infrastructure, where are they going to build it? All of, all of, you know, automatically, those conversations always lead to the same place, right? If you take a map of the United States, and you plot where the highest asthma rates are, and you plot where the infrastructure for some of these facilities are, and then you plot where the communities of color are, they're the same dots. And that's not by mistake. It's insidious. It's on purpose. And we have to remember that that violence, I'm so glad that you said that word, um, is, is going to take uh, grassroots policy change altogether now. I think we're moving, I think in the last 10 years, we're moving far further than we had um, in the past, I don't know, 60 years. I mean, putting aside great legislation, water, air, land that we have, I think finally, because of the pandemic, we're being forced to look at some of these inequalities in these communities with a different eye. Maybe a more, uh, you know, sense of emergency. Because climate change is horrible and it's going to continue to, it's already devastating our communities. It's going to do it even more. But I think now we're finally realizing that, oh, some of these communities don't have enough food, don't have enough housing. It's going to, it's about to get crazy. The other thing I think about really quickly, I don't want to take over everything, is for some of these communities, these are the norm. Like we're just, we're in a room right now saying these words. And, thinking about these horrific things, but this oppression is every day. So like you wake up with it, you go to sleep with it. It's not, you know, some, we have the privilege to, you know, hopefully not go home and do something else, go have lunch. But when you're in these communities and if the asthma rates are high, you're impacted by asthma or you're impacted by mold or lead poisoning. You can't turn it off. You have to pay your rent, you have to pay your bills. There is no escaping that. And I, I think we have, we have to figure out a way to do that more than just talk about it. And you know, we really need big change, and hopefully that's coming. Other thoughts, reactions? Yeah, I'll find it. I do find it interesting in some ways that you know the. The ones that have caused the injustice, right? The systems that have caused injustice, injustice it tends not to be the communities that comprise the communities that it's affected by it. And it's it's hard for even for like again for uh, I'll extrapolate it from an indigenous perspective, but for natives, I mean, a lot of times these you know effects on fisheries, or water pollution, water quality. Um, effects on um, you know, 
climate change, none of these things were created by, you know, by people. Yet the ones that have to deal with, the, you know, are the first to really deal with the effects of it are by people, you know, and other communities. You know, we're the ones that see, see that first. Um, and when we're not able to go out harvest our shellfish because the water's so polluted. When, when our, our trees that we harvest to create our ash in baskets are no longer growing in this region because of climate change, because of the acidification of the ocean, and now we can't get bluefish, blue shell crabs, you know, and other shellfish um, can't form their shells. You know, all these different things, um, you know, are, are affecting that relationship. And again, we have us a culture based off of that kinship systems. And so it's, it's again, I'm gonna say again, it's, it's a violent process. Um, but to, to the point that, you know, these communities tend to be where they are first affected by that. And, it's, and, and unfortunately, it's not to others are affected and that um, awareness is raised. Usually, if it's local and, and you don't see it, people don't see it, they don't, you know, it's not a concern. I guess the positive thing about climate change is it affects everybody and everyone's starting to see it. Um, but there's many injustices that happen all the time. A pond that is polluted because of runoff, runoff is affecting one community that survives off that pond. You know, that can be an example. Like, you know, that you may not know that across the state or across the country and it may not get addressed right away. So anyway, I just find it intriguing on that. And, and then the other thing, I don't have the answers. I got a lot of questions. Uh, I don't know. You can't give me answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, one thing that I, I always wonder is like the what's the machine that keeps all this going? And, and you know, and I, and I you know, you know it's to be capitalism many ways because capitalism is meant to take away those values those relationships and you want to put it into a system, a monetary system, right? That we can trade easily without emotion tied to it. So, you know, if you put a dollar value on something, you know, if you put a dollar value on your family, if I put a dollar value on my children, you know, that's, you know, it turns into monetary things and that takes away that that bond, that relationship, those kinship systems. But anyway, I wonder. My question is: is how do you how do you correct these things? How do you correct these restore these um, ills of society within a society that is built to to maintain these ills? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's like you know the you think the cure is the poison. You know, I don't know. Like it, and I you know I grapple with that every day. I, I'm in a program that gives out, you know, that wants to give services and I can help. I feel like I'm helping um, and that is good and I feel like I'm helping at a local and it turns into a, reach, uh, a regional or state uh, and, and, and go out from there. Uh, but we have to think of other systems in which we can we can address these things. Because um, I don't know if throwing money at it or, or is always the solve. I think it's going to be a combination of a lot of different approaches. A lot of different folks um, sitting together like we are right now, having a conversation on how to, how to address these issues, how to redistribute um, our access to this, these beautiful places, to that connection, to those relationships. I mean, how many people get to look out, open up their window, get to see an ocean. You know, I know my people where my, my, the Narragansett means people of the small point, which means that we are the people that live on the point, um, point Judith today, but we live on the point on the peninsula. That means we're always on three sides surrounded by water. Um, but now none of my people have any access to the ocean. We have no coastal access, no land that is uh, adjacent to the waters of our, our namesake, um, of, our, our, of our life, um, where we derive all our identity from. You know, so again, that's an example, and there's many more um, within all these communities that are have those similar um, fates within the systems that we have today. So I don't know. I don't have the answer. Um, 
<laughs> any of you do, come tell us. Don't be offended. <laughs> but but I do think that you know I think it's going to be a collaborative process, whatever it is. I think it's a process that we're going to have to. And you're going to need people from different people, different voices, places, different voices at the table um, to get through this process. Um, and again, I you know my tribe, we don't have an ancient method of dealing with climate change. Because it wasn't here, it never existed. We, we had a very small, we had a carbon footprint, but it was not as big as the one today, you know, that's what folks have. So, you know, we don't have the, the strategy, we just know, I mean, we don't want to tell you, I told you so, but some ways, that's true. But um, figuring out ways to work in balance, figuring out ways to work in balance, not just within your, your communities, but within yourself, figuring out the ways to work in balance with other communities, um, how to do things in a way, a collaborative process, I think is the, the, probably the answer. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you, collaborations. That's a great thing for you yeah. for stressing that. And also for talking about access. That is something that Lorenz Fears touched upon in oh, her good. keynote. So, thank you for reminding, of, reminding us of that. But it's also about my and collaborations as well. Uh, sure, anything you would like to say? Uh, yeah, I'll just say a couple things uh, really quickly. Um, um, also, uh, guys, I'll uh, do some Googling into like oh, into you. how to heal the whole world. Oh, thank you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know what I come up with. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, but uh, I guess uh, just a couple of um, uh, tools, I guess, just because you know we've spent a lot of time like in the um, higher realm of like, you know, um, and so I just wanted to um, share a couple of, of things that I've picked up that, you know, if, if in whatever efforts that you guys are doing to like work with um, environmental justice, frontline communities, however you want to call it, um, I, I think that a really big, um, something that we do in our program is that we really have a, um, a kind of reciprocal education model. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, uh, I'm guessing, you know, most of us like work full time, right? And, you know, have been educated in, you know, land and water science and, you know, whatnot. Um, and I guess, you know, a, a big thing is that, you know, when you're working with folks often who are most affected by these environmental justice issues, they're folks who don't have college degrees, you know? They're, they're folks who like maybe aren't familiar with these terms and, I guess, you know, one trap you can fall into is just kind of like falling into the role of like, just like transferring information and, you know, like, because maybe people like don't know what, you know, climate change, the greenhouse effect is and all, and what, you know, these technical terms are. And I think that, I mean, it is important to, you know, clearly important to be able to like share that information. Um, but I think that it's also important to in whatever practice that you know work that you're doing to um, also be learning from the people that you know that you're working with. Um, so in our um, sessions, um, our, our classes, we um, have a model where we introduce a subject and you know um, give a you know overview, and then we um, have like small group discussions where people talk about you know um, their own ideas and their own uh, lived experiences um, and then share those out um, so that we can learn about like what their priorities are, what their experiences with the issue have been. Um, for example, just to throw a good one out, uh, um, if you're learning about uh, stormwater, like green infrastructure, you know, which uh, is, um, and you're learning about like biofiltration systems and stuff, or bioinfiltration basins, for example. You know, one thing that we asked uh, um, our folks in, in our program is, you know, in your countries, like, what happens when it rains really hard, you know? What happened with that water? And, you know, something that happens in, in Guatemala a lot is because people have, in a lot of cases, deforested some areas, cutting uh, trees down for firewood mostly, or building, you know, roads and building houses on the side of mountains. When it rains really hard, there are giant, like, mudslides that happen like wipe out like whole like highways and wipe out whole uh you know um 
uh, yeah, houses and cars and everything just get washed out. And so um, that's something that, that came up when, when we asked people to reflect on things. Um, and so I guess people, you know, have like knowledge of the environment, people like have experiences and, you know, so you need to be learning from them at the same time as then you're providing these kind of like scientific tools and, and concepts for them to be able to really um, make it meaningful to them, you know, something that then they, they'd actually be able to see as important to their um, family, to their community. Um, that then they, you know, be able to, because in order for you to take an action, you have to care about something. So for many families, it's like, why should I care about maybe these more vague environmental issues when like the bread and butter stuff is the thing that's the most important to me. But when people can really, um, you know, when, when you can find that synergy of like, um, you know, uh, what someone's lived experiences are and priorities and values are, and then you know these, you know this, this other information that you can share. I think that's where you can then move people to do an action. You know, take take some kind of action. For example, you know, um, go to a meeting where they, you know, uh, you know, say like, you know, we need a we need more parks. We need more green space. We need, you know, we we're not going to tolerate this pile of you know toxic, um, you know, contaminated soil which just got dumped in our neighborhood which happened in Olneyville during the construction of uh, the highway, actually, um, two years ago. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say is, um, you know, meet people where they're at. And also, um, just another tip, I mean, paying people also for work that you do is super important. So like all of our participants are stipended for coming to these sessions, which is really important for people who, you know, um, don't have just as much free time to just, you know, be able to go to a meeting, you know, and um, they have kids. You know, we have childcare at all of our meetings as well, um, and, and food and snacks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so that's just some just some basic like tips that, you know, you, you all can take home and, uh, you know, using your work. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you. this from the lived experience and also compensating folks for that lived experience and what they bring to the table and what it takes for them to be at the table. Um, so we are at 12.25, um, if, if it's okay with our Rockstar panelists, we can take a brief question or two, and then we can adjourn the time for lunch by 12.30. Is there a burning question in, in the room? Or? I see, no, oh. we don't have any questions. Yes, Ken. <laughs> I think the burning question has not been brought up yet. The profound word. We've heard from the panelists describe it as from their viewpoint. But they're not the majority of the latter. And let's look at the majority of the latter and how it's distributed and what those expectations are. Right now, there is a deep divide in our state about who has opportunity and who doesn't. And you can determine that pretty much by zip code. So in certain zip codes, upward mobility is many better. In other zip codes, it's much less available. So that's a geographic distribution of opportunity. And that is a form of environmental justice. We use our environment as part to engage in the fact of racial discrimination. That's a word I'm And we who are the beneficiaries of that need to own up to that. That's the simple question. And we haven't done a good job doing that. In 2014, the state- Thank you for those comments. Can I just ask you to uh, ask a quick question? Or my my question question is, how do we, to this body, how do we take what we've heard, apply it to our own life, and going to make promise on history? Thank you for that. David? 
Well, thank you for bringing that up. I think uh, the, one of the questions in the, from the form that you sent us was how does the conservation, how does conservation groups and people who are working on conservation really take environmental justice as a priority and um, uh, center communities of color, the voice of you know communities of color. And I think to that thought is that we really need like environmental organizations, all of social organizations, schools, universities, really need to start putting uh, impacted community members in positions of power, um, but also so that they can then sh share their stories and then so that we can become um, more diverse, but more importantly, um, so that those ideas get put into, from the ground up, um, are made into policy. So, you know, we do need larger communities to start caring about issues that happen in environmental justice communities because, especially when it comes to passing legislation, some people are not going to care if Providence has an issue, but if people in, where, where are we? <laughs> are we in South Kingston? Kingston? Uh, if people here, Call up their own uh, representatives and say, we care about this. Uh, it's a way for you to acknowledge the privilege that you, we all, some of us have, and to also support uh, environmental justice um, issues in, in, in the state. Yeah, representation matters, right? We've had that decision table. Other thoughts in response to Ken's? I, I, I think a lot, again, this is a, a man-made issue that has to be solved by the systems that have created them in many ways, and unfortunately, but it's a legislative process. Your vote, you know, your, your voice matters. Um, so the communities that aren't afflicted by these issues, you still have a vote, you still have leadership put in charge, you still have um, all those um, tools at your uh, disposal. And then also, you know, within your own systems that you will partake in, um, the work uh, that you do, you know, make sure, like I can just reiterate, make sure those voices are present wherever they can be. Um, because they'll remind you, they'll direct you, they'll help you go down the right paths. Um, and this is not something that's going to get solved tomorrow. You know, this is, uh, this is again, it's a restorative process. It's going to take time. But all those actions are going to lead up to a a, a future that we, I think we would we want to, we'll be proud of. So let's keep the hope, the faith in that. And, and again, it's about taking those incremental steps, taking, in, talking to your neighbors, explaining to them that, you know, what is the any of them, you know, you know, everyone knows how watersheds work. So, it, you know, all this is all connected. We all enjoy the ocean, right? We want it to be here into the future. So what you're doing in Providence is not, it's, it's going to end up affecting everybody at some point. So um, so anyway, that's, I guess, my message. But yeah, we, it's, again, it's the value system. You think about the individual. You think about our own needs. Out of sight, out of mind. It's not in my backyard, so I'm not you know, concerned about it. you got to start thinking more as a community, thinking collaboratively, realizing that if someone else is being hurt, someone else is victimized, or there's injustice happening, that it's an injustice to all. So you gotta, I mean, I think that's a mind shift. And if we, more people, you can kind of get in that, in that, uh, that, that plane, I think that's, it's going to create a future that's going to work for us. Gerard, any closing thought before we return? Yeah, I guess my closing thoughts would be that, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, working with the environment, I think that we really have a deep understanding that everything's interconnected, you know, we're all connected with each other. Um, and I think one example, right, um, is that, uh, for example, uh, you know, we have this risk of flooding um, in Olneyville at, at the very, you know, close to the end of the Wenaspatucket River. Um, but really, you know, the way to prevent that flooding is to, to look upstream, where we have a vastly different demographic area. We have most of the watershed is in Smithfield. Um, and Smithfield is like, you know, mostly white and, and generally like much wealthier than the folks that live in Olneyville. Um, and so there's this huge difference um, in, in the people, but um, despite that, you know, it's, 
the, those those lives are interconnected by the fact that you know uh, if, if you you know right now we're, we're working on building connections within Smithfield uh, to talk to them about green infrastructure so that, that will help to slow down like to, 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 to filter and also slow down their rate of flooding you know when the water is dumping into uh, all their stormwater systems um, and so I think that you know in this time when there's so much like divisive stuff going on and so much political division you know um, to be able to like focus on like that you know inherent understand that you know most people do have hopefully uh, you know questionable sometimes but um, that you know this is something that is you know a fundamental thing you know that, that, that we all you know need to have a healthy environment to survive um, and those kind of things, you know, um, are things that you can bring home to, you know, whatever organization and like embed that in your values and the work that you do, um, so that we can, you know, move forward and heal things and, uh, you know, make things a little bit better in a, even if they're starting with small steps. So that's how I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you. We might have to just burn the system down. That's the end of the You know, we're all working within the system, and like you were saying, sometimes working within the system, you're still working within the system created to keep that system alive. And so, but there is some good things we can do, but we might have to start thinking of radical ways to change that. So. Sorry. So you said the whole nice thing. I'm sorry. <laughs>